Cognitive science is a fascinating field that aims to understand how the mind works as an information processing machine. For anyone interested in neuroscience or psychology, it's important to understand the basics of cognitive science. So in this week's episode, I'm talking to cognitive scientist and YouTuber, Dr. Ryan Rhodes. Brian Rhodes is assistant teaching professor for the Rutgers University Center for Cognitive Science, where he teaches interdisciplinary courses on language, cognition, and the brain. He received a PhD in linguistics from the University of Delaware, where he worked as a lab manager for Arald Hesvik's Psycholinguistics ERP lab, and an MA in linguistics from Fresno State, where he worked on the Chukchansi Yokuts language documentation project. Sorry if I butchered the name of that language. His work combines electrophysiological EEG and behavioral measures to investigate mental representations of linguistic structure, auditory prediction, and rule learning. In addition to his work as an educator and scientist, Ryan is also the creator of two YouTube channels about cognitive science and linguistics. In this video, we mainly refer to his original channel, which is just called Ryan Rhodes, where he posts videos that serve as introductory university level cognitive science lectures. His newer channel called Language of Mind is where he creates shorter videos that dive into specific aspects of cognitive science and linguistics. Now, without further ado, my interview with Ryan Rhodes. Okay, so here with uh, Ryan Rhodes, and uh, I will definitely have read your full bio for the audience, but maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into cognitive science and uh, why you decided to start your channel. Yeah, so I uh, I teach cognitive science at Rutgers. They have a center for cognitive science there, which is like, I think probably one of the best in the country um, because it was actually formed by some of the biggest cognitive scientists, uh, the most influential cognitive scientists in, um, you know, in the world. People like uh, Randy Gallistel and Jerry Fodor and Zenon Polition. It's like really big names at Rutgers. So I'm really, I'm always like really excited to, to teach CogSci at Rutgers and like be in that department. It's really cool. But my background's in linguistics. So I have, I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and a PhD in linguistics. And uh, I was really doing just theory stuff. I did some field work. I worked on a, an indigenous language project in California for my master's. I was doing um, theoretical work up to that point. But I was always really uh, fascinated by this, I, this idea, this question of like, you know, we come up with all these models, these theories about well, how we think language works, but I, I have this itch. I really want to know if that's how it works inside an actual person's mind, or like in an actual person's brain, right? If I can't find this stuff in a brain, then I'm like, what's really the point? I did eventually mm-hmm. understand that like there is, there is a benefit to doing this kind of modeling, even if you never actually address um, brains. And this is a big thing in CogSci, thinking about things at different levels. You know, you can describe computations you can describe algorithms, you can describe hardware stuff, and those are all necessary. But I really wanted to get into this algorithm hardware level, you know, and think about what is actually happening inside my own mind. Um, that was just kind of an itch that I had for a long time. So I finally got to start doing that when I, when I did my PhD. I looked for a lab that would do the kinds of things I was interested in. I got really interested in EEG. It was something that was like mentioned offhand in one syntax class that I took. Professor said, by the way, we know we've seen the stuff in EEG, like there's evidence that you really are um, representing sentences in this way. And I was like, ah, like that's, oh, that's the thing I want to do. I had no idea you could do that. And so I went for my PhD and I like, got to work in one of those labs. Like I, I was lab manager of an EEG psycholinguistics lab and it was super fun. And that's what we're working on now at Rutgers is we have an EEG machine and we're trying to get a lab started and start running some new language experiments. We're going to, uh, we're going to do some experiments with language learning. We're going to teach people fake languages, just sort of see like, what kinds of things can people learn? What kinds of computations can you actually do? <laughs> Which I think yeah. is really fun. Wow. Yeah. That, that's really fascinating. So, um, I mean, I can imagine that's, that's gotta be a stimulating environment. So are you starting your own lab at Rutgers? Uh, kind of. So we have this the lab space is a shared space. It's shared between the CogSci Center and the psychology department. Um, so we don't own the equipment, but it, we have like an agreement where people can are free to use it. And so far, I think I'm the only person who's actually like in the lab space using the equipment at the moment. But it's nice. open for everybody. Nice. Got the whole thing to yourself then. 
for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what led you to start your YouTube channel? Yeah, so uh, that happened because of the pandemic, right? I'm, I'm really invested in teaching. That's like my main job is teaching. Uh, and during the pandemic, we switched to fully online teaching. And I wound up teaching a summer course. And they said, well, you know, you want to do this asynchronously, that's fine. And I thought, okay, I'll do this asynchronous summer course. Because so many people were signing up who were in like radically different time zones, you know, people in like China, people in Alaska, uh -huh. people in the Philippines. And I was like, uh, yeah, I don't want all these people have to show up at some weird arbitrary time every day. I'll just do the asynchronous thing. I used my stimulus check to buy a camera uh, and a microphone and, you know, some backdrops or whatever. And, and I just started watching videos about like how to, how to do video editing, downloaded a free video editor. Um, so I, I really just made those videos for class. And then I thought, you know, since I made these, I might as well upload them on YouTube. Like, why not? And uh, I don't know, people seem to like it. So I'll keep it rolling. It's pretty fun making, like I'm getting into it now. Making videos is really fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell people, I mean, I, I love your videos. They're Thanks. really, really well done. Really. Um, it feels like I'm in a, I could be in a college classroom, but uh, it's not like just a boring lecture. It's you, uh, you know, giving visuals, giving all kinds of um, interesting facts and, uh, and tidbits and, um, it, there, I would definitely encourage people to go check out your channel. And it's yeah, funny the truth is that, that, that I really, I really enjoy those kind of YouTube channels, like personally, right? So when I usually when I eat lunch, I watch, um, I don't know, like Wendover videos, or um, uh, Ancient History in the America, like Ancient Americas has a really cool channel, or um, PBS Eons, you know, so these channels are like, they're sort of geared for lay people, people who are not like in those fields, but you want to know about stuff from those fields, because you're just like curious or whatever. I love those kind of channels. And so I was always watching those at lunch thinking like, man, it'd be so fun to make stuff like that for people. So people who are not in your field or people who don't have, you know, thousand dollars or whatever to, to enroll in a course at a university. If, but you're just curious about like, well, what's going on uh, behind those closed doors and being able to talk about the kind of stuff that like, I wish I had known when I, like before I went to college, the stuff that I, you know, the work that I do now, I had no idea it existed until I was doing my PhD. I uh -huh. think. That's that's crazy that like there's all this really interesting stuff happening and most of us have ju just have no idea that it even exists. So yeah. that's kind of, kind of part of the goal of this is just to bring um, this stuff, which is normally locked away at research universities, being able to tell people this is what we're doing. It's really interesting. That's awesome. That's yeah, that's that's similar motivation for my channel. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that you just uploaded them as part of an actual course because um I was talking to uh, Taylor Guthrie, who runs the channel, um, The Cellular Republic on YouTube. It's also a neuroscience uh, <clears throat> channel. And he did the same thing. He was teaching some courses on social neuroscience and decided to upload his recorded lectures and they just blew up. And um, so <laughs> I, I, I really love that you guys are both doing that and in different ways. And yeah, again, I, I just encourage people to check out your channel. Um, so I, I want to get into uh, some ideas in cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience a little bit. Um, and first, I just kind of want to get some like definitions out of the way, because I think um, it can be just confusing to hear all these terms. So I'm wondering if, if you can give us kind of what is cognitive science? What's a good definition of that? Yeah, it's always kind of tricky, right? Like what, it, what exactly is cognitive science? And I say this in like, I have that video, what is cognitive science? And I always say, I use this one definition that, that I like a lot, which is cognitive science is the interdisciplinary study of the mind as an information processor. And you can sort of break that down, right? Cause like it's interdisciplinary. It's, at, it's not its own really, it's not really its own field. It's just the intersection of, you know, like five or six different fields. Mm -hmm. So you can be a cognitive scientist if you're a linguist. It's like, I'm a linguist, um, but I'm doing cognitive science. You can do cognitive science as a psychologist, as a neuroscientist, as a computer scientist, as an anthropologist. Actually, I'm working now with a guy uh, at Rutgers who his background is in um, archaeology and mm. he switched transition from archaeology. Now he's studying decision making, but he studies like the evolution of decision making and how you can see um, human intelligence evolving and cognition evolving um, by looking at stone tools and like the process of how people made stone tools you can sort of assess their cognitive capacities and like that's super interesting and you have like all these different fields have very unique things that they can contribute to answering questions about how the mind works 
So that's, that's my, like, in a nutshell, what is cognitive science? It's the science of the mind tackled from every possible direction. Yeah, that's interesting. I, how, would you, how would you distinguish it from, like, psychology? Well, psychology is one piece of it, right? So psychologists will study stuff like um, how the mind works and how you mentally represent things, how perception works, and memory, and things like that. But then there's a lot of other stuff in psychology that's not really cognitive science, right? Like clinical stuff, it's not mm -hmm. exactly cognitive science. Studying personality, you're getting a little bit farther away from cognition. So uh, psychology is a really big umbrella. And there's sort of a, an intersection, right? There's cognitive science is interested in some of the same things that psychology is interested in. And we're drawing from that. Same way that we're drawing from some of the stuff from linguistics and some of the stuff from computer science and some of the stuff from neuroscience. But not everything from neuroscience, right? Because we're not necessarily interested in um, uh, like the really cellular biological stuff. You know, maybe, maybe some cognitive scientists can uh, find a way to leverage that into explanations of cognition. But um, for the most part, you know, we're interested in, in these maybe higher level questions. Gotcha. I forgot, I forgot philosophy. Philosophy is like the most important one. <laughs> How does philosophy uh, contribute to cognitive science? The philosophers, I feel like, are the ones who really kick the whole thing off. And they're the ones that keep us grounded. You know, they're like reminding us what the questions are supposed to be. Mm. Nowadays, philosophers have a really interesting role to play. Because I know that there's always this back and forth, especially with like STEM versus humanities, right? Where STEM is like, do we even need philosophy anymore? What are philosophers even doing? And what's the value of it? And I think it's really easy to, to get into that kind of mindset where like, you know, where show me the results, philosophy. You know, you've been doing this for like 3,000 years. <laughs> Okay, but philosophy philosophy is really important, right? It, it gets us to think about the right kinds of questions. They're the they're the people who are saying like, well, I mean, have we really thought about this in the right way? And they have another interesting function nowadays. You see people like um, you know Dan Dennett or Andy Clark. They're doing really interesting work where they will basically read a ton of scientific literature across several different fields sometimes, and they will synthesize it. And they'll say like, look, I read all this stuff about consciousness. Dan Din is really into this, right? He's like, here are all the studies about consciousness. And if you read through all of it, you can sort of find there's a story here about um, what consciousness really is and how we, should, how we should think about it. And that's difficult to do when you're like a neuroscientist and you're really fixated on like looking at very narrow things. Um, there's this kind of insularity when you're embedded in a field and you ask these like more and more and more targeted questions. You need someone to step back and say like, okay, I'm gonna take a look at the whole field and, and um, tell you some kind of story about where this is all headed and maybe how we should be thinking about it. And philosophers are, I think, very good at that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Dan Dennett, definitely. And uh, um, I remember Douglas Hofstadter, uh, mm -hmm. also kind of a crossover cognitive scientist slash philosopher. And he said something almost identical to that. Like, um, you know, it's, it's the people who are too deep into the fields that like into an individual field that can't sometimes can't see the bigger picture so yeah you yeah. need to be able to like zoom out and yeah exactly see the bigger picture yeah that's great okay well so um kind of i guess this is a core component correct me if i'm wrong of cognitive science um the computational theory of mind so maybe yeah. we can talk about what that is yeah that tends to be like a sort of core assumption in cognitive science is sort of like one of the core frameworks that cognitive scientists tend to adopt about how we should think about the mind. So this is a question, right? If we're going to do a science of the mind. And the question is how, what's the right way to think about what a mind is and what a mind does. And for a lot, for most cognitive scientists, we want to think about the mind in terms of uh, thinking about what the mind is doing in really functional information theoretic terms. And that's where like computation comes in. So when we think about what the mind is and what the mind does, we're thinking about computations. And that's, that's the core of computational theory of mind. That is the right way to think about the mind is that the mind is some kind of symbol manipulating computer, it, analogous to like, you know, an electronic computer or whatever. And people like Andy Clark will say like, okay, it's not even just a metaphor, right? It's not that the mind is like a computer. The mind literally is a type of computer. And then, if that's your background assumption that we should think about the mind as literally being a computer, then the question is, well, what kind of computer is it and what kinds of computations does it do? And we get, you know, this is even quoted in like, like in linguistics. So some of the stuff that I'm working on, uh, the researchers will 
uh, the theoreticians will say things like this. They'll say, well, if the mind is a computer, we want to know what kinds of computations it's doing. That's what we're really interested in. That's the goal. Yeah. Okay. So that, that makes sense. Definitely. Um, so I think it like, for me, it sometimes gets a little fuzzy where the boundary between the mind as a computational system and the brain as kind of the, the underlying hardware and also itself a computational system. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you see those, those two as different? Maybe that has to do with um, this distinction between cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience, but however you want to tackle that question. Well, yeah, this is, this is another one of those really central um, framing issues in cognitive science. And this is a, another one of those uh, things that we sort of, is our background assumption. We take this actually from um, a vision neuroscientist named David Marr, who had a relatively short career. He like tragically died of, I think he died of leukemia hmm. at like 35. He was, he was very young, but he had like a really influential career in that time because he wrote um, some really influential papers about the neuroscience of vision. And he wrote a book that was published um, posthumously and from that, we get this sort of foundational framework uh, that we refer to as either levels of analysis or levels of explanation or whatever you want to call it, the Marian levels, where he says the right way to think about this kind of stuff is to break it into a couple of discrete levels that give you very different kinds of explanations. And the reason for that is that you can't ever, you're never going to understand something like the mind if you're just looking at neurons. That, this is kind of his, his uh, argument is, you know, suppose you knew everything that you could possibly know about the biology of a brain. You know everything. You know exactly how all of the neurons are structured. You know all their biology. You know how they all connect to each other. You know how they fire. Whatever all of the facts are, then the question is, if you know all of that, do you know how a mind works? And I think even intuitively, you can see like, yeah, I don't know. If I knew all of that, I'm not sure exactly what I would have learned. Because none of that is really legible to me. It doesn't. It's not. Uh, it's not something I can readily understand. The same way that if I, if you ask like what's going on in your computer right now, right? Like it's doing this information transfer protocol, so it's showing audio and video of both of us at the same time. I say like, well, what's going on in your computer? And you show me some kind of map that shows where all the electricity is going through different <laughs> logic gates. I'm like, that that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know what that means. So it's kind of a similar problem, right? And one way of solving this problem is, uh, is to think about it at different conceptual layers. So with this thing, the Zoom thing, right? Think about what's, what exactly is happening. Well, one layer of explanation is just say what it's doing in terms of um, you know, the goal of what's being accomplished here. It's like, well, it's transferring sound and audio in, in synchrony. Okay, I understand that, that makes perfect sense. Now, well, how does it do that? Well, there's like another layer of explanation, which is maybe like a software layer of explanation, right? Where it's like, oh, it's encoding information from my camera in a certain way, like a grid of, um, no, like a matrix of numbers somehow. And then does some kind of compression algorithm or whatever, like right? we can describe kind of the steps it takes to manipulate the information. But again, I'm not talking about the, uh, the electronics of the computer, right? I'm just talking about like how information is being changed. And then I could say, okay, well, how is that stuff actually implemented in the electronics of my computer? So we can do the same thing for a human being, right? Uh, not ultimately, you know, if you're if you're a physicalist or if you're like, uh, um, you know, in the broad philosophical terms, if you think that like everything in the universe is ultimately reducible to physical stuff, then yeah, your mental activity must be reducible to some some facts about your brain. It's just a question of whether we can really understand those facts in isolation. We need these other like explanatory layers, say. What are the steps that the mind undertakes to manipulate information? Uh, what's the actual computational goal is trying to achieve? Then you can link those things together and, and get a clearer picture. Uh, that, that's great. That's, yeah, that, that's definitely a clarifying way of looking at the issue for sure. Um, okay, so I think we've got kind of a, a handle on, on these definitions. Um, so I kind of want to jump into some more conceptual questions about, um, I guess, concepts in cognitive science um, to kind of give people a taste of the sorts of topics you cover on your channel. And um, some of these are, are things you have covered, I, maybe all of them. Um, and actually, I, I want to quote you because I just found this quote so 
helpful in my own thinking. Um, and then maybe we can we can discuss it a little bit. Uh, but you say in one of your videos that, or maybe more than one, but uh, you say the mind is an information processor that performs computations over representations. Mm-hmm. So I think we've we've sort of been talking about the information processing aspect of it, and maybe we can discuss this idea of representations, the mental representations. So maybe you can describe what are those, and maybe the the different <laughs> types. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big question. But this is, a, is, again, like a really central thing in cognitive science. If you're going to think about the brain in terms of, or the, think about the brain, think about the mind, in terms of the computations that it does, then the question is, well, what constitutes a computation? And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the claim that a computation is, um, at, at least in algorithmic terms, it's operations performed over representations. So you have information um, usually it's information from the outside world, right? Because usually that's what we're doing is trying to like navigate the world and do stuff with our bodies. Uh, so you have to take information from the outside world and then you have to represent it somehow. You have to encode it. You have to translate it into some kind of schema that is useful to your brain and useful at a hardware level, but also at a software level. So it's like kind of, again, you can do the different levels of explanation to talk about how this encoding process works. And again, it's exactly like a computer, right? Because if I want um, to transmit my image over the internet, I have to, my computer like obviously can't transmit me directly. It's not like Wonka vision. It has <laughs> to like take the information from the outside world and encode it somehow. So it's like, you know, has um, light detecting sensors that can translate light values of light into numbers. And then the numbers are the things that's the representation of the stuff in the outside world that it can actually manipulate and do things with. And then on the other end, you know, on the monitor converts those numbers back into light that it can emit. Um, so there's something similar happening in the mind. You know, you see things, you look out your window and you see a bird or something. Light hits your, your eyes, go, hits your retina, those photosensitive cells at the back of your retina, and then converts that into some kind of electrical signal. It's like very similar to a computer. <laughs> Has to be encoded, it's encoding information somehow. And then it's converting it to some kind of format that your mind and your brain can can manipulate so you can do something with it. And then everything else that happens after that, that's that's your whole mental life, right? That's everything you experience. It's all downstream of that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what um, you in, in one of your videos, you you discuss the three different types of mental representations. And I think that's that can be a clarifying uh, concept. Yeah. for People. And that's not meant to be exhaustive either. Those are just like some very common examples. So you can think of some, some very common types of mental representations mm. being um, imagistic, like mental images. I think this is the most intuitively obvious one, right? That like you close your eyes and you can sort of see things. You can, if I close my eyes, I can still kind of see your face, remember what it looks like. Um, so that's one way of representing stuff, the stuff that comes through your eyes. Can also represent things that are more abstract using representations that are a little bit more linguistic. So I can represent ideas, you know, about um, usually invoke things about like, oh, you know, democracy, how are the ideals of uh, the country that you live in, you know, things like that. It's not really something I can take in usually through my eyes. It's not a visual thing in the world, but it's a conceptual thing. And I can represent it using language. And then we also uh, will invoke a type of representation we refer to as symbolic. And this one is a little bit slipperier in terms of how do you define it um but it's a pretty pretty pre- prevalent concept in cogsci that we think that there are symbolic representations that the mind is using to do computations this is a very jerry fodor type of view of how the mind works as a symbol manipulator and again this is like how an electronic computer works right it's all symbols ones and zeros or whatever so we think maybe the mind has things like that that are like symbols they don't correspond in any direct way to things out in the world. They're not images. They're not linguistic. They're just abstract symbolic representations of things that like, you know, atomic things that you can combine and use to represent stuff in the world. Mm-hmm. But there, you know, there are lots of other kinds of representations too, because um, we have lots of different senses. Most people, you grow up thinking like we have five senses, right? Those are the ones you hear about. Um, five, I think. <laughs> yeah. turns out we have like way more than five because you have senses of like you can f- sense where your limbs are if you close your eyes and that's not exactly the same as touch um you have senses of like if your bladder is full <laughs> it's also not exactly the same as touch you know like stuff like pain. that it turns out we have yeah. lots of that kind of stuff 
And all of those things have to be in all of that information, all of that, you know, that all consists of information that has to be encoded somehow so that you can do things with it. Even like feeling hungry, you know, you think your stomach has to send some kind of signal to your brain that says I'm hungry. And you can think about that as a type of information that's being transmitted from your stomach to your, to your mind so that you can like make decisions about what you're going to do with your body. You think like I'm getting this signal that means hunger. So I think I'm going to activate my legs and walk into the kitchen, you know, <laughs> but that's all, that's all computation. It's all information processing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, that does make sense. Although I, I kind of want to go back to the, uh, the symbolic representation. So can you think of an example of something of like a symbolic type representation? I can think of examples in linguistics. So linguistics mm. is, is mostly symbolic. Like all of the, the models that we have about how we think language works are really symbolic. Um, they all involve symbolic computations and symbolic representations. So it's a little bit difficult to tease apart if you, um, you know, if you've never taken a linguistics class, it's some, sometimes hard to get into the headspace of thinking the way linguists want you to think. But think about something like, um, you know, we think of a couple of words like pet. And I, I may think I used this example in one of the videos, pet, cap, and spy. You know, what do these three words have in common? And most people are going to have an intuition. Most of us are literate, so we're all going to have the intuition like, oh, they all have the letter P in them. Uh, I was going to say noun. Like, <laughs> oh, they're all, oh, they're all nouns. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Although English is pretty flexible, so I think they can also all be verbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they all have, they all, we all spell them with the letter P. But even if you say, well, what would an illiterate person say? Because there are people who have never even been exposed to letters. And they would still say they have something in common. They would probably say, oh yeah, they all have this um, P thing, the P. So there's something there, there's something that, that speech sound that's the same in those three words. Right? The odd thing is that it's not actually the same. So if you actually look at the spectrograms or whatever, right? You, know, you look at how, what, how the acoustics works, it's not the same sound in those three words. It's actually very, very different. But psychologically, we treat them as being members of the same category or um, you could think of them as like mapping to the same kind of symbol somehow. And maybe this is a little bit easy to think about because we actually do have a visual symbol that we use. It's P. Right? <laughs> so that might, might be an example of a symbolic representation, something like a speech sound. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that is really interesting. Um, I think I, I, I'm wondering, I hope people don't get confused by this, but um, when you say it's not the same sound, the, the way they know that is by looking at the, the sound waves, the, the different frequencies that make up mm -hmm. the sound, and uh, they can show that these are, in fact, pretty different if you look at it from that level. Um, you can do a couple other tests to show yourself, to like prove to yourself that it's different. Um, in intro to linguistics, we always have people put their hand in front of their face, you know, say the word pet, and then say the word spy. And when you say the word pet with your hand in front of you, right, you can feel the air hitting your hand, pet. But when you say spy, you don't feel anything. There's no air. It's like not that burst of air. So it's mechanically different. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So then um, just to, to tie off this point, um, how is it, I don't know, this is kind of a, a, a very specific point, but how is it that we do... Um, figure out or that we we group those together why do we think that uh you know pan is the same sound as the p and spy that's a great question um and there is an answer to that right like the reason that we know that it's the same is that you can make new words and you there are processes that happen where like you can take a little piece of a word and add something else to it and then the way that you pronounce a p will change um, I have to think of an, <laughs> I don't have an example offhand right now. I'd have to stop to think about an actual example. So I should have come prepared for this. <laughs> no, I, but it's, I, it's, I, I find the examples I can think, it's much easier for me to think of examples in other languages. So this is really common in other languages, um, like German or Russian. If you speak German or Russian or language of that type, they have a, they have a, a process or a, like phonological rule um, that applies to consonants at the ends of words or at the ends of syllables. And um, so like in German, for example, if you have a word that ends with a D, um, like, so, you know, like I think of German words, I got to go all the way back to high school, think of actual <laughs> German words. 
<laughs> I guess I think of an adjective like um, this is morbid, but the adjective like the word for dead is tot in German. You know, I'm not sure if that's actually spelled right. I'm kind of an illiterate, illiterate German, so I gotta make sure it's spelled the right way. <laughs> Anyways, and I have, you can edit this, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of a word in German that actually illustrates this. Oh, okay, here's a word. Um, the word for day is Tag. And it's, it's spelled with letters, it's spelled T-A-G. But it's pronounced Tag. And uh, if you, we, in German class, we used to have a thing called the word of the day, and it was called Wort des Tages. And so if you add that es suffix, it, the word shifts from being tak to tagis, where it changes kind of from a k to a, from a k to a g. You think like, well, why is that happening? Um, well, because underlyingly, it's actually, it was always a g. It's just that there's some kind of rule that applies that changes it to a k in that context. But when you change the context, it changes how the sound is pronounced. But the underlying symbolic representation is the same. And that's the thing that's really interesting. So you have in English, this pet cap spy thing where the sounds are really different in terms of their acoustics, but it's the same underlying mental representation, we think. That's the, that's the theory. That, okay, yeah, that, that does make sense. Um, all right, so now we've, we've kind of gone down this rabbit hole, a little bit of a symbolic representation, but um, Something that I thought was was very interesting in your video on mental representation uh, that I'd heard of before, and I, I think is just really great for people to understand. And the way that you describe it is is really interesting. Um, so I think it's the Wasson selection task, um, mm -hmm. and uh, how or I'm sorry, no, that was <laughs> that's the wrong one. Um, sorry, the uh, different that was a different one, but uh, the. Weber's law of just noticeable yeah. difference. Um, sure. So what does this have to do? What is it? And what does it have to do with mental representation? Yeah, Weber's law is kind of interesting. Um, and it's one of those things I think makes intuitive sense when you think about it. But the basic premise is, say you, you take a glass of water and you dissolve some salt into it. Uh, and I take another glass of water and I dissolve some salt into that one. And you know you have two two glasses of salt water, and you taste it. You taste the other one. They say, okay, which one has more salt in it? Uh, it's a lot easier to tell the difference between the two if the difference is really big than if the difference is really small. And that's obvious, right? That like it would be way easier if this one has twice as much salt. It'd be like, ah, you know. And if this one only has a tiny bit, I'm like, okay, it's not that bad. I can tell the difference really easily. But what Weber's law says is that that ability to tell the difference between two things, it's not just a function of how different they are from each other. It's also a difference. Uh, it all, it's also dependent on how much of the stuff there is in the first place. So it's really easy to tell the difference between you know two eight ounce glasses of water if one is um, a, you know one is a little bit more than the other. But you take that same difference. So if it, let's say we have two eight ounce glasses of water, one of them it's uh, you know one part salt to one part one glass water. The other one is two parts salt to the glass of water whatever the arbitrary you know, salt water ratio is, but it's just two arbitrary units versus one. Um, so that's easy to tell. One is twice as salty as the other. Now scale it up so that you've got like a water tower, you know, full of water. And one of them has, you know, this amount of salt to get that concentration. And the other one has that plus another four ounces of salt water concentration. And you're like that four ounce difference. That's really easy to tell when you're when you have two eight ounce glasses. But a four ounce difference when you've got like a water tower full of water is impossible to tell. It's just like, how could I possibly detect a four ounce difference in salt water levels when I'm dealing with, you know, a million gallons or whatever? That's a really extreme example, but it's like, that's the basis of Weber's law. So same thing if you were going to like compare lengths of lines. Um, this is one of the class. Actually, I think the original example was, was weights. Mm. Um, and I think I do is I put like bags of pennies in my hand, you know. So you hold two weights. And if it's like one pound versus a pound and a half, okay, that's easy to tell. Pound versus a pound and a half. Well, now I, what if I increase the weights to 50 pounds and 50 and one half? Then you're like, uh, you know, they're really similar. I don't know if I can tell the difference between 50 and then 50 plus one half, even though the absolute difference is exactly the same. 
And what this tells us is it tells us that the way that we're encoding this information is we're not encoding it the way a computer would, where you just label 50 on the one hand and then 50.5 on the other hand. And it's like, well, those are obviously different numbers. So that's like trivially easy to say they're different. We're encoding it in a really different way where what we're really encoding is the ratio. Um, that's a very different kind of mental representation than if we were to encode the exact values. So it tells us something really interesting about mental representation. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. <laughs> it does, no, it does. It's very interesting. And um, just a sp specific point on that, um, you mentioned uh, that it was, it was, was it two percent was the lowest um that's what Weber found just noticed because i had heard and i, I don't know where i heard this but uh ten percent so i don't well, know where 10 that percent is definitely doable <laughs> yeah yeah that's um, maybe better for me yeah and just to give people the the numbers i'm referring to are uh the the difference between the two stimuli uh so if it's a bag of pennies if it's uh two percent heavier Weber found that you would or mm, on average people would be able to tell the difference between those and two. i think you know i think it might vary by modality too so mm -hmm. what you can mm -hmm. tell with bags of pennies might wind up being a little bit different than what you can taste when you're drinking salt water and that might be different than what you can tell um by listening to different pitches things like that they might all have their own that makes sense system yeah because i think i heard it uh the volume like of mm -hmm. sound as being 10% or, or maybe it was the intensity of a light or, but, uh, regardless two two 2%, um, on weights or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, those were his original experiments yeah. were with weights. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, I'm like, I don't want to do a, a whole exhaustive, um, you know, recapitulation of your video on mental representation. I'll, link to that. I want people to go check that out. It's very interesting. Um, but your latest video, uh, at least as of this recording, is the logic of social cognition. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was a this was a very interesting video because I didn't know uh, which direction you were going to go with it. Um, <laughs> but it 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 turned out very, very cool. So I'll just have you describe what is the now we're getting to the Wasan selection task mm -hmm. and uh, how our performance differs in uh, depending on how the situation is framed. Yeah, right. So this Wasan selection task, uh, this is something he found in like the 50s, I think 1957 or so. It's an old effect. But the core question here is, how good are we at evaluating logical conditionals? Um, so you, you ever took like an intro to logic class, you have to draw like these truth tables, right? To like, it's like doing math, essentially, you know, you, you get some propositions like if A, then B, or like if A or B, then whatever. Um, so you got to do a kind of calculus to figure out the answer. But you can also map that stuff onto language, say like, like you know, these things can be encoded uh, with language and sentences. And then the question becomes like, well, how logical are people in general? How good are we? at doing that kind of calculus, um, using just whatever automatic kind of language processing cognitive machinery we've got, how, logic, how likely are people to evaluate these kinds of logical propositions in the way that logic tells us that we should? So are people, how accurate are people at this kind of task? And it turns out that like how good you are at this depends on factors that are, are very unexpected. It's, it's one of those unusual things where I'm like, huh, uh, I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect myself to be like better or worse at this task, depending on what I'm asking about. It's like, how good am I at determining at, sorry, I'm gonna go back. How, how, how good am I at interpreting a logical conditional? Uh, how good I am depends on what the logical conditional is about. And that's really kind of weird because you don't usually think of it working that way for other kinds of cognition. Why would it matter? I'm trying to figure out if a statement is true or false. And I become better or worse at doing that, depending on what the statement is actually about. That's a, from a computational theory of mind perspective, that seems very odd. It's not how computers work, you know? Um, yeah, because then, it, it doesn't, just to clarify for people, it doesn't, none of this depends on your prior knowledge about anything right, in particular. Right. It's just evaluating logical relationships right. in different uh, framing, different contexts. Yeah, and I try to come up with like, uh, you know, logical statements that, that should encode things that people aren't super familiar with. So you can try to get at like, 
yeah, even if it's a totally new um, proposition you've never encountered before, you're going to be better at it if it involves social rules and you're going to be worse if it doesn't. And that's like really specific, right? It's like it has to be social in nature and it has to involve rule breaking. It has to involve some some kind of cheating. If someone is cheating in the scenario, then you become really good at figuring out if a rule, a logical rule is being followed. And if it's not social and it's not clear that there's any like cheating, um, then I'm not that good at evaluating it, actually. <laughs> so odd kind of like motivated reasoning. Yeah. So maybe we can uh, just give like an example of, I mean, not that we have to come up with a, a perfect logical relationship, but uh, just to kind of illustrate the, the difference. Um, so maybe like what would be a good example of kind of a, a sterile logical non-social uh question yeah so a, a sterile non-social logical question usually we do something just you're flipping over cards you know um and you give some kind of rule like here are some cards they always have a letter on one side and a number on the other and the rule is that if it has the letter e on one side it has to have a number four on the other side that's it that's the rule it's, it couldn't be simpler i think as a rule it's very clear so then i lay out some cards Here's a card that has an E on it. Here's a card that has a four. Here's a two. Uh, here's a J, you know. And the question is, um, which card do you need to flip over to figure out if they follow the rule or not? And you want to do like the minimum number of flips. So which ones do you actually need to check? Do I need to check the E? Do I need to check the four? Do I need to check the two? Do I need to check J? Like which ones actually need to be checked? And the first time I, when I was introduced to this, I got the wrong answer. Most people seem to get the wrong answer. Or maybe it's, you know, like 60, 40 or something. It's, it's surprising. Like, it's not everybody, but it's, it's a lot of us. And even, yeah. you know, if you've taken, like, I've already, I, had to, I had taken a logic class. And so I was like, huh, that's funny that this kind of got me. So I always tell people, you shouldn't feel bad if it gets you, if you get the wrong intuition. It's very normal. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I think I, I definitely got it wrong um, watching your video, and I've, I've seen it before too, and I just was <laughs> like, no, okay, uh, not, not going to work. But, um, but on the other hand, uh, there are these examples where it's kind of in a social situation, and mm -hmm. then people's performance goes up, even though you know you could say these are logically equivalent mm -hmm. statements, logically equivalent uh, questions. Um, so what would be like an example, and, and it's a specific type of social situation involving cheating. So what would be an example of that kind of question? Well, yeah, I, I link a paper in the description of the video. It's like Gigrenzer and Hoog, and they tested a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that they did was they come up with novel social rules from a culture that they think that their um, participants for their experiment would be totally unfamiliar with. Um, so if we're talking to like this you know, Western educated, industrial, rich, democratic, the weird, the weird. crowd, <laughs> uh, then you can give them a rule from another culture that they've probably never encountered before and say like, okay, here's uh, an island in the South Pacific. And in this culture, um, men are, so if, if a man is eating taro root, then he has to have tattoos on his face. That's the rule. So if he's eating taro, then he has to have tattoos. It's like a rite of passage kind of deal where it's like, that's how you become a man. And there's some kind of special food that's like only for men of that status. It's a, it's a social rule that sort of restricts what people are allowed to do. So then you do the same scenario, like who are you going to investigate to find out if the rule is being broken? You know, here's a man uh, who doesn't have tattoos on his face. Here's a man who does have tattoos on his face. Um, here's a man who's eating taro root. And here's a man who's eating cassava. Who do you need to actually investigate? And, and I think in this case, everyone's intuitions should be like clicking like crazy, right? It's like so much easier to figure out what I need to do in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so it's, Andrew, which, which is it? Who, who you got to investigate? Um, well, <laughs> I have to hear the, hear the options one more time. You got a man uh, with the tattoos. You got a man without tattoos. Mm -hmm. You got a man eating taro. You got a man eating cassava. Who you got to investigate? And the rule is if he's eating taro root, he, or wait, is it if he has a tattoo? It's if he's eating taro, he has to have tattoos. Okay, okay. Then you would just need to investigate the man eating the taro. Yeah, you got to figure out if he has tattoos or not, right? Yeah. And then also you need to investigate the guy who doesn't have tattoos because you need to make sure he's not eating taro. Right, right, right. Yeah. And that's like 
super clear, I think, to almost everybody who hears this scenario, even though you've almost definitely never been in that situation before, and it's probably a totally novel rule. Yeah. And I will say, I think uh, the the audio, audio medium might be a little bit more difficult to wrap your head around yeah. what we're talking about. But uh, again, go check out Ryan's video, The Logic of Social Cognition. It make total sense. Um, so what does that say about it? What does that say about um, how we think? And, and what does it say about our evolutionary history? Yeah, that's the interesting question, right? Is like, why would this be true? And is there an evolutionary story for why this would be true? And um, John Tooby and Lita Cosmides, they've kind of made their career out of uh, investigating this and they have their theory, which is that, well, um, you know, it seems like we just have some kind of very dedicated mental module for detecting cheating. Like we're just hardwired to want to detect cheaters. So when you present this to me in uh, some, some abstract rule where it's like letters and numbers, I'm like, I don't, I don't care about that. My, my mind has not been like evolved to solve that specific computational problem. My mind has been evolved to solve a much narrower computational problem and that is to find cheaters. And it's like, I'll do whatever I gotta do to figure out who's cheating, even if that means being really good at logic. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really weird because you think like, well, if my brain does have the ability to evaluate these logical conditionals um, really accurately, why does it only activate in this case and not in the other case? That's a, I don't know. I still think that's a bit of an open question. Why is it so selective? Clearly you have the cognitive capacity to do it, but it's like it only activates in certain situations and not others. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's almost like it, it can only be activated by specific cues about about cheating and uh, yeah. free riding and right yeah right, so exactly. I mean I I love that that problem um, it's it is really just intriguing to wonder what what is what is the deal with that um, there are so many things like that too <laughs> oh yeah yeah and um, speaking of that I I kind of I want to maybe zoom out a little bit and ask you some kind of bigger questions, maybe bordering on philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. um, if you're all right with that, we can kind of jump sure. into that. All right. I'm not a philosopher, but I'll try. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we've been talking about the computational theory of mind, cognitive science. Um, and usually most of my guests tend to be on that like neuroscience side of things. So I ask this very simple, uh, easy question of, how the brain works um, and ask them to give me an elevator pitch type answer to that. Um, and so I guess I would put it to you, how does the mind work? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, my, my one sentence elevator pitch is gonna be operations performed over representations. You take information, you encode it somehow, and then you manipulate that information. It's all information processing. That's, that's the level at which I, I'm comfortable answering that kind of question. That's how I want to think about it. Yeah, no, that that's really good, really concise. I think it's it's almost con as concise as I think uh, one of my guests said about the brain. It's complicated. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was thinking like I wouldn't want to answer this question about how the brain works because like, <laughs> yeah. oh, there, is there a unifying theory of brain? I don't know. <laughs> Not yet. Maybe think. we'll go the Carl Friston route and say how does how does the right. mind work? Let's just say prediction error. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Free energy. Uh, the free energy <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, great. That was that was easy answer. We know the, the answer to how the mind works. Um, so this is something I ask everybody who's in these kinds of fields. Uh, what's your view of free will? <laughs> oh, my God. This is such a can of worms. And I'm like, I'm debating whether I want to give an honest answer. Do it. <laughs> um let me i'm gonna tell you a little story i was actually very interested in philosophy when i was an undergrad and uh, i went to community college first for you know two or three years i took all of the philosophy classes i could there was only one philosophy um, teacher at my community college i took all the classes and i was super into it went to university took a couple more philosophy classes decided i i wanted to major in linguistics so i kind of dropped it but Part of that process of me deciding, you know, like, I don't know if I want to keep doing philosophy, uh, 
part of that is actually about free will <laughs> and like the experience I had trying to try to grapple with the question of free will in, in philosophy class. Cause I was actually, I was really fascinated by this question of free will. It's an interesting question. You know, do we have free will or not? And like all good questions in philosophy, it really hinges on your definition, the definitions of the terms, right? So uh, it, it's a really intractable question if you don't have a definition of what free will is, but that's exactly, that's the question. So on some level, the question of do you have free will is really just a question of what do you mean by free will, right? So what is what constitutes free will? And I, in one of my philosophy classes, I just read this like really amazing to me, what I thought was just a total knockdown argument against free will, like not necessarily in favor of determinism, but it's sort of like the argument outlines, look, every um, decision that you make, every action you take is either the cause is either that it's always going to be the end result of some causal chain unless you want to introduce some some theory and philosophy that enables you to violate causation but even if you even if you do so events either have to be caused and follow some long causal chain in which case people might be reticent to consider that free will because it's just the result of chemical reactions or whatever um, or you can think of it as being uncaused and effectively random like what we sometimes maybe think happens with quantum mechanics and like, don't quote me because I'm not a physicist. This is the, the extremely lay person understanding of quantum mechanics, having read like that one book. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's my understanding that there are certain things that can happen in quantum mechanics that are uh, not necessarily outside of the causal chain, but at least very un extremely unpredictable. Um, either way, that doesn't really feel like what we would mean by free will. And so, you know, I encountered this argument not really, I'm not really uh, reciting it the right way, but you know, I encountered this argument. I was just like, wow, this is a knockdown argument. I can't think of a definition for free will that would actually like satisfy my intuitions and, and not violate causality. Or like if it did violate causality, it just wouldn't feel like it fits the definition. Um, so I, for me, that kind of settled it. I was like, yeah, I don't think free will is really coherent concept. Um, but then at some point I, I was really wrestling with this because I thought, well, most philosophers, uh, are very, I, I found out that like most philosophers are compatibilists. I thought, how does compatibilism mm -hmm. work? If, why is it that most philosophers have settled on something other than determinism? You know, that's maybe, I, I think that actually a lot of, um, a lot of scientists might have this intuition. They might share this intuition that like determinism seems reasonable given what we know about the universe and what we know about physics and the way things work. Determinism seems for some of us almost inescapable. And then it's, it's kind of an odd feeling to, to find out that most philosophers are not determinists. And you think like, wait, what, why? What, what am I missing? Am I missing something really important here? And I finally, I read some stuff about compatibilism and I finally understood of it. Okay. So what happened here is philosophers um, wanted to avoid determinism, I think. Determinism is, uh, you know, that's not, not necessarily... Yeah, it doesn't maybe fit what a solid conception of free will would be. It makes free will incoherent. So if you want to rescue free will as a concept, I think maybe the best way to do it is to maybe change the definition from something that is totally undefinable and something that seems to be completely incoherent and adopt a definition that is more coherent and say, well, you have free will or we'll consider you an agent to have free will if you're free from coercion and free from force and things like that. So that's what compatibilism says. It says, yeah, you, maybe everything is just the end result of a causal chain, but we're still going to consider it to be free will as long as it's free in this, you know, high level abstract kind of sense in the human sense, the human world of nobody was really impinging on my freedoms and I made the choice myself. So I'm going to consider that free will. That's my understanding of compatibilism. Maybe that's wrong, but I, I, found, I found it kind of a frustrating experience because I thought, well, yeah, I guess it can be true if you change the definitions of the terms. Um, but where does that land us? Doesn't that mean that the original version of free will that everyone was thinking of really is incoherent and doesn't work? And I think that, yeah. <laughs> so I think the only options available are either, are probably, well, this is really reductive. And philosophers will get mad at me if they see me hear me <laughs> that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, you probably are on a fork between compatibilism and determinism. And those two things, you know, compatibilists would, would say, yeah, those two things are um, compatible with each other. That's why it's called compatibilism. <laughs> yeah. Free will is compatible with determinism. But it does necessitate you to take this definition of free will 
that uh, maybe is not what people were imagining to begin with. Yeah, yeah, I I uh, I agree with that perspective. I mean, it's not because I, I think some people think that scientists just want to reduce everything to mm -hmm. be reductionist to to take it to this ultimate material level, but it's just that I don't see a way out of that exactly as you described, other than to change change the rules of the game basically and uh and i don't think that's an like you said i don't think that's answering the question that we're we're actually worried about but i think I, yeah oh sorry go ahead good no no no. go for it i was say there's a very similar um there's a very similar debate in philosophy that applies to cognitive science which is about how you define a mental state so like what is a mental state and is a mental state um distinct from a brain state so this is a big question because there have been um, polls that have been done. There are like actual published studies on this that where people do surveys and they find that like most scientists are physicalists, where most scientists, if you poll them, they'll say, I don't think there's a difference between mental states and brain states. They're equivalent. And cognitive scientists tend to push back on this and say, well, we want to maintain a distinction between these two concepts uh, because it, it gets really tricky to talk about mental states if you have to reduce them to brain states, just because of the sheer amount of variability involved in brain states. Like even the brain state between me and you are gonna be different, um, but I still wanna be able to talk about us experiencing similar things or having similar mental representations fitting into like some kind of category, right? So it's worthwhile to introduce a new term or to redefine a term so that it encapsulates some conceptual layer that enables us to talk about something that we wanna talk about. And sometimes that can feel like a cheap rhetorical trick. And sometimes I do get that, that I have that knee jerk reaction to things like compatibilism. I'm like, ah, you know, you're just redefining the terms. That's not fair. Um, but on another level, like, no, it's perfectly fair because we still want to be able to talk about this thing without getting quagmired into arguments about, uh, you know, causal chains or arguments about, um, you know, these fine details about neuroanatomy or whatever. We want to be able to talk about things at a different conceptual layer. So yeah that's, you know redefining terms can can serve that purpose yeah that's true I, I mean i don't mean to dismiss that project entirely um i guess i think where i where i think the rubber meets the road for most people on this is well okay if you and i are sitting here saying there's no real free will no no libertarian free will as it's called mm -hmm. um where you you can change the the causal chain of the universe through some sort of mm. mind uh thing uh mental you know act um but what does that mean for me as a person how how can i look at my life and say well there's all these things i want to change about myself or this growth that i want to have in my life um how do we make this idea compatible with people you know changing for the better hopefully well, you know, even, you know, free will is a, is a big thing, but like even consciousness, consciousness is also a huge concept, but like, you know, Dan Dennett, his explanation of consciousness is that it's an illusion. You don't actually have consciousness. You just feel like you do. It's just a bag of tricks, right? It's just a, a cognitive bag of tricks that leaves you with this weird feeling that you're conscious, but actually most things are happening pretty much automatically. And a lot of the conscious experiences after the fact, all this stuff. Um, you could take the same kind of approach to free will. So like, how should this change the way I think about myself? I don't know. Should it change anything? Maybe not. I think that it's fine to live your life uh, treating yourself as though consciousness is real, as though it's not an illusion, treating yourself as though free will is not an illusion, because that, uh, that also has an effect on your behavior. But of course, I am on some level a determinist. So I am going to, you know, part of me wants to say that like even this conversation and like me thinking about how this is or isn't an illusion or how it should affect my life is also still part of that long causal chain. So like, whatever, I don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to think about it the way you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, uh, I think like I heard um, Christopher Hitchens say that when, when they would ask him, w do you believe in free will? He'd say, I have no choice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, I definitely feel like I do. Um, so it, on a practical level, it may not matter. It may not matter. I don't know. But there is sort of a practical level to this question that is relevant for fields like psychology, which is to what extent can people change their behaviors? 
To what extent can you change another person's behavior? What kinds of things can be done to shape behavior in particular ways or to shape the kinds of thoughts that you have? Sort of the essence of therapy, right? Mm -hmm. And those are very valid practical questions to ask. And it doesn't help at all. You know, if, if someone is depressed and you say, well, you know, that's uh, there's no <laughs> this determinism. So whatever, you know, like, that doesn't help. No, <laughs> we have one of the worst things I would bet you could do. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, well, I, I'm sure we could we could continue just uh, spinning on free will. Uh, but it's yeah, it's very interesting concept. I I mean, in my my view, it seems like it's not fully solved yet, but uh, I just I side with you. I think, you know, your intuitions align with mine. Um, so. Uh, the next thing I want to ask you is about uh, books. So if, if somebody could only read one book about cognitive science or the mind or the brain, and I, I try preferably not a textbook if possible, but uh, if it must be a textbook, that's okay. Yeah. Oh man. What a question. Only if you only get one book to read about the mind, I'm going to like, look at my shelf. You know, what's on my shelf? Help me out here. I can't see your shelf. So no, I know. I'm like I'm asking the books. To asking speak to the me. shelf, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. Andy Clark is good, so I think I might default to Andy Clark. Either Andy Clark or Dan Dennett. And Andy Clark has a book called Mindware. That's a good one. I think I'm just gonna. I'm gonna go with that one. <laughs> okay, cool. Mindware. I'm gonna go with Mindware by Andy one. Clark. I'll have to check that out. Um, well, that that's good. Right? What was it? Sorry, Mindware by. By Andy, Andy Clark? Clark. Okay, cool, cool. I'll put a link to that. Um, all right. So finally, this is really a question for me, for my benefit, uh, and anybody else out there who's doing any kind of science communication. I mean, I see you as a, a very awesome, like an awesome science communicator. One of the, my favorite on YouTube for sure. Um, so I'm just wanting to know what is your, how do you think about communicating uh, these kinds of complex topics to a general audience and i guess your your audience might be more skewed toward like students toward people in college but right now i definitely i think is okay i hear from a lot of people watching my channel that say like oh i'm i'm thinking about majoring in cognitive science or uh, things to that effect i'm like oh cool <laughs> but in terms of yeah science communication like how do you I mean, it's a great question you know how do you communicate stuff to to an audience um I, you know, I don't want to say that I haven't given any thought to this because I don't think that's true. I think I have probably given a lot of thought to this, but it's maybe hard to articulate. Uh, I guess I, I have this experience of, of watching this kind of content from other fields. And so I have a sense of like, what is it like to be a person who doesn't know anything about this? And what do I want from, you know, someone who's explaining this to me? What do I want them to do for me? What do I want? How do I want them to explain this? And uh, I do think about that a lot. And you gotta, you gotta sort of stay cognizant because I know, you know, we talked about this earlier, how you can get really um, focused on very narrow area of your research. And this is, this is a challenge. This is like a real challenge for people who have domain expertise. It becomes really difficult to understand what other people know and what they don't know and to understand what they understand and what they don't understand. It's hard for all of us. And I still, you know, I'll think back to like the, some of the lectures I gave and I think like, oh, I still need to improve some of this stuff in terms of understanding where how to target this to people who have never heard of it before it's challenging but that's the main thing is to just try to stay aware of um what kinds of background people come come at this with and what they know and what they don't know and it's helpful if you've been through that experience yourself so like i didn't i wasn't originally a cognitive scientist i came to it pretty late so i have kind of a sense of uh what kinds of things stood out to me as i was entering the field that like really clicked. And I'm like, okay, those are the things that I can bring to people and say like, here, look at this. This I think maybe will help you understand the whole thing. Um, so it, it, helps if, uh, if, it helps if you've struggled because then you understand maybe what other people might also be struggling with. That's great. Yeah, that, that reminds me of uh, another great cognitive scientist, um, Steven Pinker said mm -hmm. that, uh, it, or it might not be original to him, but he mentions in one of his books, The, the Curse of Knowledge. And yeah, this idea right. that it's much harder to know how uh, 
how hard it was to learn something originally, just as you were saying, mm -hmm. um, or to even remember that, even if you, you know, it, it was really hard for you to learn it, uh, it might not remember, you know, each of the individual concepts, how difficult each of those were for you to understand. Um, and then when you explain it to somebody, you want to try to really break it down because you have to exactly, as you just said, like, imagine that you're in their shoes and not knowing a lot about this subject. That's, that's really cool. I've, I've heard that from, from multiple uh, uh, people who I, how I follow and I, I love that point. I also have the benefit of being a teacher and it's kind of like, uh, you know, how, like you asked a question about how do um, stand-up comedians write their bits. And part of the process is going to the clubs and seeing what lands, you know? And so I have the benefit of like, since I actually right. teach live classes, I get to like take this stuff to class and try to explain it to people. And if they look at me like, you know, I get, <laughs> I get pretty immediate feedback about what works and what doesn't work. And that's helpful too. Yeah, I'm sure that is. That's just like immediate uh, feedback. <laughs> that's cool. Well, I think that that's just about it. Um, thank you so much for talking, Ryan. It's been really enjoyable and I've, learned a lot from you. And I, again, I know I've said this probably five times, but go check out Ryan Rhodes channel on uh, YouTube. It'll uh, enlighten your day and your mind. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. This, this was really fun. Great. And uh, can you tell people where to find you? Well, I, I have a personal website. Uh, it's wavyphd.com. So I think that one's pretty easy to remember and pretty easy to say out loud and my, and my twitter handle is wavy phd so that's also probably pretty easy to remember um and my youtube channel is uh, a little bit maybe a little bit harder because it's like ryan rhodes cog sci something like that but if you look up ryan rhodes cognitive science it comes up immediately on youtube because i don't think there's any other there is another prominent ryan rhodes that comes up on youtube there's a boxer <laughs> <laughs> that one's not me uh, so if you add cognitive science i come up right away Awesome. Okay. And I, I will link to all that below. Um, all right. Great. Well, thanks again. Yeah, no problem. All right. That's it. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of Sense of Mind. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel and to the podcast. And also consider giving this show a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you use. As always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This episode was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.